Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, I wanna thank all of this morning's panelists thus far uh, and, and James Harder's uh, work to date. A uh, bunch of very interesting conversations this morning. Um, I think we're gonna continue the interesting conversations with our next panelist. I'd like to introduce uh, retired US, United States Air Force Colonel James Reganor. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Veritex Incorporated. Um, James has been a very well-recognized global thought leader in the blockchain space for greater than five years. I, I'm very proud to say I also consider him one of my mentors in this space. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about looking for the silver bullet uh, that we can use blockchain technology for. Uh, James, I'm proud to say, has actually taken that bullet, forged it a couple times as well as shot it. Um, and he's done multiple MVPs over the years um, that have provided great value both commercially and on the military side of things. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to James to discuss uh, decentralized manufacturing and his company, uh, Veritex. Thanks, Tim. Uh, just by way of just a little more context, and, and that was a very gracious introduction, I appreciate it. A little more context. Uh, in the Air Force, I spent uh, 31 years flying airplanes, and uh, my last a command, I managed an organization of about 2,000 people in 11 locations, uh, I'm sorry, in 15 locations across 11 countries and three continents, um, doing about 65,000 maintenance touches a year on aircraft. Um, so I started to understand really kind of the pain points in logistics uh, around uh, running large organizations that were, for the most part, decentralized and spread out across the globe. Uh, I also spent some time in the White House, three years on the National Security Council staff. I was with President Bush when Hank Paulson walked in uh, and said, Lehman Brothers doesn't exist. Uh, Bear Stearns will be done by the end of the day. Um, so a lot of this helped form kind of where I got to where I was at, uh, where I'm at today. And I'm going to walk you through kind of the, the processes that got us to where we're at, and we'll discuss um, kind of the use cases. I'd like to share my screen very quickly, if there's such a thing. And I'm going to show some slides. Uh, if I can get up here. All right, we'll get started. Everybody buckle up. There'll be a lot of topics covered in a short period of time. But I, I think what I'll, I'll try to do is we've been um, some of the themes from this morning. I've been listening to everybody's presentations. And uh, so I, I think I can be helpful to kind of weave uh, some of those ideas and thoughts through. If we look at kind of the history of societies, Societies uh, were formed around rivers. Um, we saw cultures spring up around rivers, whether it was the Yangtze or the Danube or in the US, the Mississippi or along the, the Hudson. Um, we saw commerce uh, exploit rivers to move goods to market. We saw states and governments spring up around rivers and use rivers for demarcation, use rivers um, to help fortify a country um, and keep it isolated when need be. So those were the rivers of yesterday were filled with water. The rivers of today are digital rivers and the society of today is a digital society. We see our culture moving to a digital space, whether it's on TikTok or Insta or Facebook. We see commerce initially with the start of e-commerce and now with the start of digital commerce. And we really saw digital commerce flourish during the pandemic as did e-commerce. But digital commerce in particular is where you can buy a digital asset and consume it at the point of use. That consumption during the pandemic for a lot was binge watching Netflix or maybe new apps or new music. Um, but that's digital commerce in a B2C type of environment. Um, today we'll talk about digital commerce in a B2B environment, what's going on. We also see with cryptocurrency, some of the traditional roles of the state as defined by the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1600s are being usurped by entities that aren't a government. So we have cryptocurrencies that are coming up that are uh, non-governmental currencies. Why do we have that? Well, after that crash uh, of the markets in uh, 2008, we saw a mistrust of governments. But fundamentally, currency and money flows have changed. Why have they changed? Well, when we had the US dollar pegged to the gold standard, there was an anticipation that when governments borrowed money, they would actually pay it back. I would say, that anticipation or that understanding no longer exists because of the large deficits we run. And we can just use our own country as an example. I don't think anybody in the right mind thinks we're ever gonna pay back the trillions of dollars that we owe. 
we'll just keep borrowing on top of that and paying interest and so on. Um, but that has caused a mistrust that we'll talk a little bit about. Trust is a central theme throughout, whether you're dealing in the DeFi or whether we're gonna deal in the decentralized manufacturing or in the cryptocurrencies. So kind of for me, how I got here, I'm not a technologist. Uh, well, I guess I am a technologist, but I, but I don't have a technical background per se. I flew airplanes, as I mentioned. I'm a geographer. Uh, kind of uh, in a, had a minor in Chinese, I'm undergraduate, and I'll say my master's degrees that I have don't apply to this space at all. But what I was able to develop was kind of a keen understanding of technology in the future. And I think it was mentioned in the last uh, presentation, it's technology has never solved a problem. So think about that. What has solved problems is the application of technology. So creating that business imperative or those business objectives as was mentioned in the first presentation, is really what leads technology to solving problems. So keep that as kind of context as our framework as we go forward. So I see the world in kind of three buckets. The first bucket was digitization. And we got digitization with the internet. And we were able to communicate with email. We were able to um, scan documents and create PDFs and that sort of thing. So we had this transition from moving, as was said before, uh, paper to parchment into this digital space where we could actually record things uh, in this uh, upload and, and share them in this digitization. The next bucket is digitalization, where we can actually create in the digital space. So think about using a digital CAD uh, drawing. You no longer have to use dra drafting tools and, and paper and, and these huge desks that we used to occupy hangers full of space in the aerospace industry. Um, to design parts. We can now do it on a computer and we can take that design and we can pass it to somebody down the line to do a quality check on it or perhaps to uh, add to it or subtract from it or so on. Uh, so that's digitalization. The other thing we can do within the digitalization space is now we can do simulation and modeling. So think about when you're designing something, you can now actually create a simulation. Companies like Ansys and others have physics-based models and simulation where you can take your design and you can do a digital wind tunnel test perhaps or you can do a digital stress test and you get very good results. So that's the digitalization. And for me, the space I like to work in now is that space between digitalization and digital transformation. And digital transformation simply is where you take that digitalization and you create new value and new business models. So as we think through this process, as we get to where we're gonna to get to at Veritex, it really went from a digitization to a digitalization to how do I transform an industry, which was the aerospace industry in the aerospace supply chain. What we first had to do was we had to unmoor blockchain from cryptocurrency. Um, when I first went to, I worked at Moog, where Tim works. Um, when I first uh, went to our CEO at Moog and said, hey, we've got this great idea. It's blockchain. Uh, we're gonna use it in this supply chain uh, logistics type business and, and you know, there's something to it. Now this was uh, November of 2015. And I'll kind of I'll highlight a little bit as we got here and then I'll, I'll go back over it as I talk about the use case. But the words uh, out of the CEO that day was, Jim, because when I think of blockchain, I think blockchain, Bitcoin, Russian mafia. Um, so I think as Lennox said before about nefarious actors and dark web and that sort of thing, I think early on, most people associated blockchain with that. It really wasn't blockchain, it really was the use of cryptocurrency. So what requires us to move beyond crypto and get to where the real value of blockchain is, um, whether it's creating a credentialing uh, application, uh, as was mentioned previously, or, or some of the other applications um, that were highlighted in the first presentation. It really is how to unmoor crypto. And I think that's the world that we're starting to open up. That's kind of the Pandora's box is when we can divide those two aspects and we can look at blockchain as a whole of what it provides. And for us, uh, again, it's not blockchain looking for a solution. Blockchain, if you have to mention a word, um, we haven't really got far enough down the pike yet into that beyond that uh, uh, acceptance level. We should probably not have to mention blockchain. It's just like when we think of uh, the internet today or um, the internet today is really 12 protocols, but most of us know about HTTPS, SMTP, that sort of stuff. We don't know the other nine protocols that are in there. The same thing will happen with, with, uh, with blockchain. We won't have to mention blockchain. It'll become the scaffolding in the background for the applications that we're developing. But it's key that we unmoor it for our business case to work. 
So there's kind of been three waves of, of kind of uh, this blockchain revolution as Don Tapscott would call it. Uh, the first was that crypto on the ICO craze. And we saw that come up in 2016, 2017. Uh, we saw huge swings, a lot of in the market. We saw a lot of projects, white papers, they did an ICO, initial coin offering. They made a lot of money and then those projects fizzled. And then we kind of got to, to the doldrums where that kind of fizzled out. We went through 2018, 2019, and we started seeing some of the projects actually have legs that actually hung around. So uh, Ethereum is a, a very good example. Ethereum actually hung around and now it's prospering, but it got through the doldrums. There were applications that were built using that blockchain that then allowed it to grow. But we saw quite a few projects um, that went away. So there was a lot lost in speculation. The next wave that we're starting to experience um, in 2020 and we're still experiencing now was really DeFi. It was really how could we create this decentralized finance that allowed peer-to-peer -peer transactions or peer-to-peer -peer traditional banking applications. Um, and it's fascinating what's going on with DeFi. But DeFi couldn't come before the crypto or the ICO. So, so these things had to come in the serial nature. Um, and next, what we think is the next wave is really DMAN or decentralized manufacturing, where you can take trust outside the four walls of the factory and push it to the point of use. So you can actually consume parts, much like you did with that Netflix, but you can consume physical parts at the point of use and the time of need. And blockchain is what's enabling that. There's been other uh, instances where you could take and purchase in an e-commerce fashion a part and say it comes from, say you're going to purchase it from overseas, it comes from Japan, it comes through the port of Long Beach, it's then put on a truck and it's shipped to your location and you consume it. All right, you bought that on a computer, you point and clicked and did it. So um, speaking to the Assistant Administrator of Customs and Border Patrol early on, uh, I asked, hey, how are you guys going to, I'm sorry, Border Protection, how are you guys going to actually uh, protect the government or protect the consumer or protect the industry with digital commerce. And at the time, the deputy administrator says, well, we do that every day, Jim. Well, you know, we have customs inspectors at the port of Long Beach and they look at containers right here. I said, no, digital commerce is, I'm gonna buy that same part in Japan. It's gonna be sent to me via the internet and I'm gonna produce it at my factory here in East Aurora, New York. And nowhere in there is customs gonna have the opportunity to stop and look or if it's going the other direction from New York to Japan, how am I gonna manage ITARs, which are restrictions uh, on arms controls and things like that? How am I gonna manage that? How am I gonna manage IP proliferation? How am I gonna manage counterfeit of these parts? Because counterfeit's a big deal, whether it's a Gucci handbag or it's a counterfeit part made in an aerospace provider. In aerospace, however, it's got a big consequence of failure. You put a counterfeit part on an airplane and it fails and that airplane falls out of the sky. And we don't have to look too far back in our history to find an example. There was an Alaskan Airlines flight in the late 90s that had a jack screw on the elevator that was counterfeit. It was put on the airplane unknowingly and it failed. That airplane crashed when the jack screw failed and the elevator went full up and they lost control of the airplane. Uh, 167 lives were lost as a result. So in industries with a high consequence of failure, you have to have protections. You have to have trust. So in our use cases, what we've been looking at is really not blockchain in and of itself. Uh, I think blockchain as a, as a, as a um, singular proposition, is, it's got a very linear growth trajectory. It's really when you can marry up blockchain with other technologies in this technology convergence zone that you can create exponential value. And to me, that's what's important. So in our particular use case, we're marrying up blockchain with 3D printing or blockchain with, as somebody mentioned before, it's hard to do with physical uh, uh, objects or blockchain with physical objects within the supply chain. We're leveraging blockchain in the case of 3D printed parts, blockchain provenance to provide data integrity, process integrity, and performance integrity. So that when we take a part off of the printer, we know that we've got a good part. Uh, in the case of a physical uh, thing that starts as a physical object, we're using blockchain to create a digital twin. That digital twin is then followed through the full product lifecycle to create aggregatable data sets that can be used for predictive and predictive maintenance models. So think about this, I can create a digital twin. Uh, to go back to the last medical uh, example, what if we could create a digital twin of, of my body and it would follow every single thing that happened to me, whether it's my medical record, whether it's my education record, whether it's my driving record, whether it's my flying record, 
that all be melded together and create my digital twin. Well, we talked a little bit, somebody mentioned SSI. I have a digital presence. I'm an e-resident of Estonia, which gives me a digital presence. We'll see more countries, states, or organizations come online with um, sovereign identifications. In our particular using verifiable self-sovereign identification to create manufacturing execution systems. So think about this. I've got to pass a part. Tim's the next intended person that the part's supposed to come to. And now I can program that part to say it can only be received by Tim. And Tim has this SSI, this verifiable SSI. And I'll say SSI and verifiable interchangeably. But when I'm um, the difference, I think, verifiable has a bio element to it. So it's not just a swipe card, but I also have to have an iris or a scan or a thumbprint to make sure that my physical person is the one who's applying the card. So that's verifiable. Um, in the case of a, a machine, uh, uh, because we're using SSI, whether it's a people, person, or process uh, machine, uh, we're able to create these data flows. But in this case, very securely, if somebody gets between Tim and I and tries to intercept that data and it's not paired with the SSI, they won't be able to do anything to it. They won't be able to execute it. It'll break that chain. We actually make a much more secure manufacturing execution system, a much more secure digital commerce solution, um, considering ITARs and the other regulatory requirements. So we'll talk a little bit more about SSI. Um, I think it's worth also talking about kind of um, some of the uh, data bias that goes into. Um, so when we're looking at technology, uh, we're looking uh, in the uh, civil world, we're looking at the internet of things. So if I can take direct data directly off of a sensor and use that to um, carry the data or a data tag on blockchain and use that for my solution, I take any dirty data or human bias potentially or human error out of that data solution. So I get a very clean data set. If I have to take data where a person has to manually enter it, then there is the potential for data bias or dairy data. Um, so as we start looking at these convergence zones, the same holds true in the military. They're creating what's called the battlefield of things, um, mesh networked um, so that they can populate data and they can get inside the enemy's OODA loop or inside their timing cycle for decisions. Uh, all that comes together. Um, the other convergence to look at is AI. What can AI do? Well, you need to have clean data, as was mentioned earlier, to have a good AI solution. So if your data is immutable, transparent, and carried across that data integrity rail on a blockchain to your AI application, you have um, good data and you have a good application. So those are some of the ways to kind of look at some of these things as we go forward. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our use case. So our use case was really developed around 3D printing. Um, the company I worked for, which was Moog at the time, had acquired a 3D printing business uh, in Detroit. And I had been uh, running the aftermarket for uh, uh, military aftermarkets um, and working on all the, at all the different large depots uh, for the DOD. And I didn't want to do that anymore. So I said, hey, let me take a look at really what we can do with this 3D printing. What will it enable? What does the future look like when we can do this 3D printing? And I very quickly realized 3D printing would become a commodity. And the real value was not going to be around 3D printing, but it's going to be rather, again, that digital transformation uh, cycle I talked about, what new business models, what new value could we create? And so my background was on scenario-based planning. So I set up a couple scenarios, and one of them was you're on an aircraft carrier, you're in the Indian Ocean, sea state level three, you have an F-18 on board, and it has to fly a critical mission, lives are at stake, and it needs a part. I've got a 3D printer. How can I send a part directly from the original part manufacturer to that aircraft carrier so that be, it could be manufactured and put on the airplane and the crew chief could tell the pilot the plane's good to go, go fly. That was the conundrum we had. So in scenario-based planning, what you wanna do is you wanna live in that future state that you're trying to design so that you can eliminate bias. So what we did was we put ourselves on the aircraft carrier and we looked backwards kind of at that value chain to see where there were gaps, where technology that was available today could be used to fill those gaps. We knew nothing about blockchain, nothing at all. We had a colleague that had come back from a hackathon at MIT. And he said, hey, do you guys, have you ever heard of blockchain? And we said, nope, we scratched our heads, jumped in uh, Wikipedia, then jumped into uh, Blockchain Revolution by Don and Alex Tapscott and said, yeah, there's something here. 
what was the something? Well, having flown airplanes for 31 years, uh, typically when I'd walk out to a jet, I pick up the forms. If they're signed and dated in the proper location, I knew the aircraft was good to fly. It didn't matter if it had an engine off or it had a wing off or whatever. It was all assembled and somebody said it's good to fly. So, so what was going on there? Well, I trusted that the person that signed and dated had the authority to say it was good to go. So really what this um, use case distilled down to was how could we create trust out here on the aircraft carrier that the part coming from the OEM the data hadn't been hacked, the proper processes had been followed, and within the build chamber, it had been assembled or built or heated correctly as it was built, and we could take it off and have a good part. So that's really what we had to solve for. All of a sudden, we started looking at blockchain. We said, hey, this is going to help us. We have this immutable record. We have this transparent record. We can use smart contracts to create uh, a, a manufacturing execution system for process integrity. Um, inside the build chamber, we can use convolutional neural networking. We can record uh, the data. We can use physics-based modeling to say this is what the part should look like layer by layer by layer. So using a facial recognition tool, we could describe what the faces look like, compare as we built, built, and compare the temperature of the laser to the required temperature. We could pull it off and say, we've got a good part. Previous to that, you'd have to pull it off and CT scan it. Um, we also realized that we could do something called just good enough. So let's say the part had to be created in titanium, but we only had a, a, a printer that could print stainless steel out on the ship. Well, maybe we could make a part and only certify it for the next flight or for 50 hours instead of the 2000 hours that the titanium part was. But it would allow us the opportunity to use that asset and it would allow us the opportunity to have that physical asset if we needed brought to us. So we started thinking in those terms, okay, well, what do we have here? What are we actually enabling? What it distilled down to was we were coming up with a solution to increase uptime and the availability of this asset, the airplane. So whether it's a ship, train, locomotive, piece of machinery, it mattered all of a sudden. What we also realized was there's many more things that you can do with 3D printing. In the case of the medical field, um, 3D printing now, uh, if I'm gonna go in for a knee surgery, I get a knee that's made just for me. The surgeon gets a jig cut for the cut that's supposed to happen. He may get tools made just for my leg, for his hands. So this world of hyper-personalization, lot size of one, started to become a reality. No longer did I have to rely on a t-shirt model of I need a small, medium, or large knee and we'll cut the bone to fit. So everything now becomes hyper-personalized. The same then holds true on these airplanes. We started to find use cases around obsolescence. A lot of the Air Force and Navy airplanes that were built in the 1960s and 70s are still flying today. The manufacturers are long out of business. So getting parts is difficult. In fact, last year, the Air Force took the B-1 bomber down to Wichita State and the Army took the UH-60 to Wichita State and they had the airplanes digitized. They created the digital thread for each of those parts. Why? Because they don't have solutions for a lot of them because the manufacturers are out of business. So start thinking in those terms. Whether I'm a farmer in the field in Iowa and my combine is a 1980s model and it's down right during harvest season, I can't afford for it to be down for a week, but now I can get a 3D printed part sent to a printer near my farm, have the part made and get it back up and running. So it became about uptime. So then what then came of Veritex? Well, we started asking the question over and over again, what now, what next, what does this enable? And what we really uh, realized was we're enabling this digital future, this digital end-to-end -end supply chain, where we could go all the way from real-time uh, uh, inventory management in the RP systems to discovery with a VR uh, headset, HoloLens, walk around on an airplane saying, hey, that part is dripping on that airplane, open it up on the airplane, open it up on the HoloLens and say, hey, I need to replace that part right there. I could then push it into a digital maintenance records that would trigger a supply, uh, request. I need this part and everything required to replace it. It would also signal a repair request. Once that part's available in supply, I need to go back out and fix it. Then the technician could go back out, have all the procedure in his hollow lens, reduce maintenance errors, and be able to very quickly change that part out. On the other end, when we convert that part to a physical part, so we take that digital thread, we make it now near the flight line, we convert it to a digital part, I'm sorry, to a physical part, we can now create a digital twin and monitor that part throughout the full product lifecycle. So all of a sudden, we now have an end-to-end -end supply chain. 
What are we really doing though? We're creating a data company because monitoring that part as it's built, as it's used, we could now create aggregatable data sets. We could create these data lakes and rivers that we could use for knowledge and wisdom and be able to create these maintenance models. So that when the airplane was in to have uh, worked on on one item, we could look and say, hey, in the next 20 hours, these other parts are predicted to fail or need to be replaced. Let's get them today so that we don't have all this unscheduled downtime. So think about that, very exciting. Um, what were we actually creating beyond that? Well, we also created a new modality of logistics. How did we do that? Well, traditionally parts had to move across the surface, either by, uh, either by a vehicle, a truck, by train, or by ship, right? And we've seen throughout, throughout uh, the evolution of logistics that we've gone from ships to trains to planes, um, but now all of a sudden we could go to digital logistics. We could create a digital asset and we could move that asset now to the point of use. So that's what this Veritex allowed us. Then the question comes, well, how do you interact with the customer? Well, we came up with the Accelerate platform where customers can create a storefront for their physical and digital assets and then sell them to the customer. So all of a sudden you have buyers and sellers. And we said, well, we need service providers on here too. We might have somebody that wants a 3D printed titanium part, but doesn't have a metallurgist familiar with titanium. So maybe they need to reach out and get a service provider. Or maybe at the end, we printed this part in Hawthorne and it needs to go over to Los Angeles International Airport. So how do we do that? Well, we have a service provider that will pick it up and you'll be able to track it just like your pizza all the way out to the airplane. But we started putting together all these service providers in this different value propositions to create this platform. So that's kind of what got to the Accelerate platform. Now, how have we leveraged that? Well, we also realized that if you're on an aircraft carrier or you're on a spaceship or space station, you've got the same dilemma. You need data, process, and performance integrity. There's a high consequence of failure. So we leverage this technology to say, hey, if you're gonna make something in space, we can use the Veritex process for that. And it allowed us to do that. We've also um, started uh, early on uh, in 2018-ish, uh, the idea of non-fungible tokens. So how do you take 2 million parts of an airplane and tokenize it. Well, it's a series of non-fungible tokens. So if you think in terms of, if you're familiar with an ERC721 token and you have the ERC20 tokens, you're able to start building tokenized airplanes. So think of a, a, a purse within a purse, within a suitcase, within a larger suitcase, but they're all NFTs. And when you change out one part, it ripples all the way through those NFTs. But now we are able to do that. We've taken that same application, we've applied it to the nuclear enterprise. So think about how you track and trace nuclear materials, nuclear critical things, uh, nuclear warheads. I commanded a nuclear squadron in the Air Force, so it's near and dear to my heart. But, but there's a lot of applications for non-fungible tokens, um, not around art or around uh, sports events, but really around practical applications of how do I manage things? How do I manage a rotable pool? Um, well, I can tokenize the parts uh, with, via NFTs and so on. So there's been a lot of, of uh, I'll say, early invention, uh, early innovation, a lot of collaboration um, through this to be able to create this place. But we think in the future, it's gonna be a marketplace uh, that's build it where you need it, when you need it. And that's kind of how we got to where we were. That's the Veritex model. Um, I'm gonna pause there, we'll leave 15 minutes for Q&A. And, &A, and I, I thank you for, uh, I, I thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak here today. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I, I think you actually derailed one of my questions I had for you <clears throat> because uh, one of the ways that I gauge an adoption of technology is how it proliferates through the mainstream media side of things. So if you think about blockchain, uh, it, was, it was out there for a while and then the TV show, The Big Bang Theory had an episode that had blockchain and Bitcoin in it. Uh, that kind of brought that to the forefront. And Saturday Night Live just recently had one about non-fungible tokens. So I was gonna ask you that question, but I think you touched on it briefly as far as the differentiation between blockchain and an NFT and how they're either synonymous or disparate, but I think they're more synonymous than not. Um, but I think you've answered that. We can circle back to that, but I do have a question from uh, Andrew Phillips on here. Um, which is asking what companies are leading the blockchain revolution and what gives the companies a competitive edge? I think when you talk specific to a company, maybe that's 
a bit of a, a misnomer, but I think if you boil that question down to how do companies in general gain the competitive edge using blockchain technology, I think that's a question that's pertinent. Yeah, so appreciate Tim, and, and I did like the uh, Big Bang episode, and uh, I particularly like the NF NFT on Saturday Night Live. Yes. Uh, you know, it, I think back even in 2020, there was a, a Super Bowl commercial about blockchain IBM had one, um, which is odd because IBM's not really, it's a permissioned uh, a permission blockchain, so it's, it's uh, I'd say, less of a blockchain. But to answer your question, how do companies um, really create value and differentiation? Um, I, I think it's when you work in that trough between digitalization and digital transformation. So how can you transform your business? How can you create new value leveraging the attributes of blockchain? Whether it's immutability, whether it's transparency, whether it's attestation of authenticity. I didn't mention that we're also using blockchain to, to drive uh, counterfeit parts out of the aerospace supply chain. I, I mentioned that, but, but how, do you, how do you get there? I think one of the ways to look at it is how do I create market space? It was highlighted in the beginning that the government is a place um, to use uh, um, blockchain. I'll say early on, what we did, I went down and spoke to the uh, uh, members uh, of the HASC and the SAS, and also the blockchain uh, um, caucus that had just stood up, which was uh, Jared Paulus and uh, Schweinert uh, from Arizona at the time. And it was really about how do we prevent additive manufacturing, so 3D printed counterfeit parts from entering the supply chain. And there's already provisions in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation for electronic uh, counterfeit parts. How do you prevent them? And we just took the words electronics and put added manufacturing and slid that in front of them. Well, the, 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 in the Defense Authorization Act of uh, 2018, it came out and they asked the departments, specifically the Department of Defense, how you're going to mitigate counterfeit parts within the supply chain. We then took our solution over to the Department of Defense and said, hey, look, we have the solution for providing attestation or authenticity of 3D printed parts. And you know this, Tim, you live this with me. But, uh, and then we did the uh, proofs of concept um, for all the departments, which um, hopefully informed that request back. But so you can use federal regulation to help you. So a company that's savvy, understanding how you can leverage federal regulation and or law to help create market space is a company that will create new value and differentiation. So you almost have to go out there and explain to people what the market is or what the question you're trying to solve is, and then go to them with the contextual tools to solve that problem. Um, but that holds true whether the market's the government or whether it's a B2C market, as was mentioned earlier, you know, L'Oreal wanting to use uh, just a consumer to, to take some of the arbitrage out, some of the professional um, firms that are there that, that, that do the R&D for these different companies. Early on, I thought, blockchain would take out a whole bunch of arbitrage. But what I learned was it didn't really remove the arbitrage. It redefined the um, kind of the role of that arbitrage. And, and I realized early on, the relationships still matter. There's still a, a humanality to it. There's still a human relationship. Um, you can't get rid of hundreds of years of relationships with just throwing technology at it, right? Um, however, you could establish the trust, um, which was very interesting. I'll pause there. Yep. Perfect. I think you're going to like this next, next question a lot because it's something that you and I have talked about quite a bit over the years. So here's the, the question. So it's understandable to see digital assets in supply or in supply chain made tamper evident. But how do you see physical assets being made tamper evident? The two ends of the supply chain producer and the consumer, although blockchain does support the supply chain digital validity, the underlying physical aspects still are at very low maturity with legacy processes. How do you see Veritex addressing some of these gaps? So basically, how do you take that physical component and tie it back to the chain in Delibu? Yeah, so um, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, if you're gonna manufacture it, um, you can use programmable nanoparticles today that will carry the identification of that part. Um, but often parts become part of an assembly or a larger part of a component and so on. And there's this phenomenon called Frankenstein parts, which I learned about from Ford Motor Company from uh, Prima Mitra there. And um, where they'll take uh, you know, the, the um, ID, the part ID, the metal placard on a part, and they might even pop that off and put it on something else. Or they'll take just a core in the inside of it, they'll have all different other parts in there. But, but to the consumer, it looks like it's, it's the right part. Um, so the way to do that is, um, we're using different uh, tag ins, different RFID codes, 
different ways to help manage the identity of that part. So if that part was going to be, um, the overall part was going to be, let's, let's just use an NFT, for example, going to be an NFT. The other subparts that are associated with that, those associations would be um, captured. So you'd have all the different, whether it's a, um, you know, a component that had five or six different parts, you'd have the provenance of the other parts captured at the same time within that. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way is to, to use tagants um, to help identify. So if I'm going to manufacture a part, I can manufacture a tag into that part. And typically with a tag you have to destroy the part to get the tag out. There's a multitude of different tag and different ways to do this. Um, the final way is there's, a, there's another solution out that's uh, it's diamond dust. You can actually use this diamond dust on parts that will help to authenticate that part. So um, there's different things that have to happen depending on what the application and need is um, for you in the physical world to be able to manage but the most important thing is you still have a human entering data. So if you can get to the point, as I mentioned before, where you can do a scan of a barcode or something else that takes, lifts the data directly, it doesn't have to be inputted, um, you can eliminate error, dirty data, and bias. But those are the things to consider as you start building out your end-to-end -end supply chain. How am I going to be able to create providence all the way through the initial requirement through full product lifecycle is the question. In the digital world, that same question exists the minute you convert it to a physical item. So it was created by a digital thread. That's everything in the digital space. And then when you convert it into a physical item, you create a digital twin, which is a one-to-one -one representation of each of those items. And then you can aggregate around families or sets of data or machines. It gives you some tools that aren't available today. One is rapid reverse forensics. So if I have a part that fails, I can rapidly go back and figure out what did it fail for? It was a bad powder mix, a bad machine, a bad operator. Using that SSI schema I mentioned before, you can neck the offending size down to um, what it needs to be instead of saying ground the fleet. A good example is Johnson & Johnson. In 2018, they recalled 20,000 hips. Why? Because they didn't know what the offending hips were they were after. If they had blockchained all their hips, um, they would have known, hey, I only have to go after these 200 hips. They subsequently lost a $3 billion lawsuit. It's an appeal. Um, but think about that, all the hours and time they spend. I know in the aerospace industry, if they have an escape come out of um, the factory, which happens, it takes months to figure out the root cause analysis. If they have a part that fails in the field, it takes months because all the data needed to be aggregated is still in paper. So being able to marry up that digital process with the physical part or digital part um, will matter. And there is very strong value there. Outstanding. Um, so you, early on in your conversation, you had mentioned that technology had never solved a problem, right? It's basically not until you choose to apply the technology that you actually solve something. So without a problem, technology for all intents and purposes might be useless. Um, I think a different twist on that specific to blockchain technology is the best use case of blockchain is the one where the end customer doesn't even realize it's there. Um, so to that point, I know that you mentioned a few of your demonstrations and pieces of work that you've done over the years for both the commercial aviation side and the Department of Defense. And you talked about the merits of the trust and the provenance aspect. But if we were to boil that back down to the value add to the overall process, could you provide some sort of metrics or um, thoughts around how what was done for the DOD and for the commercial aviation side, how that impacted their side. Yeah. So Tim, I'll, I'll, use a, I'll use an example that you and I both worked on. And it was, uh, we were gonna do a proof of concept in real time um, for an airline. And the airline was going to launch out of, uh, uh, out of the Pacific region uh, en route to Los Angeles. And it had just a benign cabin part that failed uh, en route. And that cabin part was in a business premier seat, which is the highest class of seat which sold from anywhere from six to $11,000 per leg uh, for these long distances. And it was gonna be three legs before it could get back to where there was a physical part available. So it would have to um, not be able to put a button seat and would lose potentially up to $30,000 of revenue. Um, we had seated a digital part in the supply chain in Singapore. And that airline was able to purchase that digital part, push it to Tim and I physically uh, at the uh, tech ops for that airline and we manufactured it on-prem. Uh, it was then inspected uh, by the airline and put on the airplane when it landed. So 
what was that part? It was, uh, you know, not an expensive part. Could we have charged 10x for that part? Most certainly could have. But what we realized in that was the value wasn't associated to the cost or the price that that part was sold to. It was really in the opportunity cost of what that part was going to enable. It was going to enable the airline to use that seat for the next leg. Um, so think in those terms of use case. Uh, we talked about uptime, whether it's uptime of the whole airplane or uptime of that seat, or it's really about what is the opportunity cost for what I'm going to make. So one of the early on questions in, you know, when uh, Lockheed Martin called me down to have me uh, speak about digital supply chain and their executives um, was, you know, what parts should I digitize, Jim? And I said, just the parts your customers want. And they said, well, they want everything. And I said, well, exactly. That's what you're going to have to do. The question then arises, who's going to pay for the NRE, the non-reoccurring engineering expense to be able to convert that part from a how they traditionally manufactured it into a digital part. Um, and that really comes out of this new pricing model. And the new pricing model simply is, what's the value of that part? So it's gonna fluctuate, it's hard to pinpoint it, but each user is gonna be there. So, so I think, Tim, what you see is this transition around opportunity cost, around really quantifying what uptime value is. And when you look at an air, airline or an airplane, tens of thousands of dollars for every hour spent on the ground or day lost is, you know, could run into $100,000 worth of revenue. So it's really about that model. Um, I, I think I think that gets to fundamentally gets to the answer. Awesome, James. Thanks. Uh, one other question. We're down to the last four minutes. Uh, I think you could probably fill it up with this, but we, a lot of the applications we've been talking about have been more uh, traditional. Uh, there, I know there's a future in space explore, exploration and colonization. I know you've been doing some work there also with blockchain. Uh, similar to what you've mentioned thus far, but can you give the audience a little bit of a feeling for the differences in the extraterrestrial applications of blockchain and their benefits? Yeah. So what we find is wherever there's going to be a high consequence of failure, which is space, space is unforgiving. Typically you get one shot at doing it right. And then, you know, the, the consequences are catastrophic. Um, so you're going to be able to have to ensure Again, that when you send a part and things will be manufactured where they're needed. We're not going to take rockets of spare parts like we do with a, when we deploy airplanes overseas. We take these big conics as full of parts, um, but we're going to take the material and we're going to take the ability to make things. Um, so you're going to have to be able to ensure that the data is correct. You're going to have to be able to ensure that the processes are, processes are uh, correct. The other part you're going to do is, you know, we may be competitors on Earth with China and uh, Russia and some of these others. Um, or, you know, we may be competitors in, in the commercial world, maybe SpaceX and Blue Origin and so on. But when you get to space, there's no competitor. Um, if I have a space colony on the moon and my neighbor, who happens to be Chinese, a mile away, comes over in his rover and says, hey, our oxygen scrubber is broken. We need one. Can we borrow yours? The answer is surely going to be yes. Or if I don't have a spare one, it's going to be bring your people over here to live in our compound until we can get yours running. So this idea of cooperation um, really will dominate the space and uh, pun intended, but it, it, will, it will be there. So how then do you use blockchain to enable cooperation? You have to have systems in place that if now, if I have to take Chinese data or Chinese process or so on, that I can very quickly do an audit, check, you know, make sure everything's the way it's supposed to be and be able to make that and so on. So whether it's data, um, I'm sending communications, I can use blockchain for that. Uh, whether I'm going to be sending uh, physical parts uh, or parts to be turned into physical parts, I, could, I can use blockchain for that. Um, we're thinking about having rotable pools of spares um, that other countries can provide and use and utilize, um, you know, creating non-fungibles to be able to track the lifetime, the, the cycles on those different parts will be important. There's many, many, many use cases yet to be discovered. But, but, but I think, again, as we said earlier, if we have to say the word blockchain when we do this, then we're still not far enough along. Blockchain will be embedded in the technology, the best of blockchain, the interoperable blockchain that can move from chain to chain to chain and not lose the data. The scalable blockchain that can do multiple transactions at the speed of Visa and MasterCard today. Those are the blockchains of the future. Have they been invented yet? I don't think so. I think they're gonna be a, an amalgamation of the best, uh, the best of series of the different blockchains that are out there. Um, what will the consensus uh, mechanism be? Will it be proof of work, proof of stake, proof of authority, some hybrid? Uh, how will SSI play in that? Um, all these are questions that are starting to be discovered. Um, I'll go back to the, you know, the healthcare use case, that digital twin. You know, if I have an SSI, I don't really have to worry about HIPAA because that data is not associated with me, the person that someone knows. It's associated with me, the person somebody doesn't know. And, and a really good case is 
Um, in Toronto, um, they're taking medical data and they're letting people not have to pay their copay or, or partial pays that they have to pay um, if they give up their data. And they're giving it up with a digital identification so that it's not attributable to them. So there's many, many, many use cases out there, many in the industrial, many in the healthcare, uh, many in the education, um, but uh, I'm excited about it. And I'll tell you, you know, just three more patents. We've got two more coming uh, later in the week. Um, you know, we're filling up the patent space with ideas, a lot around N N NFTs and so on, but, uh, but really some on also how you manage data, how you encrypt data. And I heard somebody mention quantum key distribution. Uh, the pundits are saying uh, quantum uh, computing will, uh, you know, be able to break the Byzantine and, and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's all BS because the first applications we use quantum for is encryption and quantum key distribution sets and so on. So uh, I'd say the future is very bright, Tim, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present. Okay. Colonel, thank you very much for the enlightened conversation. I, I hope that the audience found it thought provoking um, and interesting. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Harder. Um, and uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I want to echo what Tim said there. Thanks so much for your uh, presentation and answered some questions for us. Um, Colonel Rigoner, this was an excellent uh, session for us. And, uh, you know, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you. And as a quick maintenance thing, uh, we're going to take about a 14 minute break and then we'll be back with uh, our noon session, which is going to be Wendy Henry from Deloitte. And so if you guys want to just stay on the call, we'll be coming back on at about right at noon. Thanks a bunch.